are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. I was pretty terrified to plan that trip. Like I just, it felt like a lot, but I felt like I had no choice. And I think it was one of the biggest gifts that my mom left because going through that and undertaking that, it made me realize that I could do that on my own. And so that kind of like gave me the confidence I didn't have before to undertake trips from then on. This is Radio Juxtapose. Hello. Thanks for downloading this episode of the Radio Juxtapose podcast. It's really nice of you to do that. I'm speaking to you just now from about a month into self-isolation. Thanks to the COVID-19 coronavirus. Cheers, pal, for shutting us all inside just as soon as it starts to get nice outside. I hope you're looking after yourselves wherever you're locked in from. Hope you're all keeping active physically and mentally. It's the key to this, isn't it? God, you'd go mad otherwise. You've been watching a lot of Netflix. That tiger thing was a bit mad, wasn't it? We speak about animals in today's podcast. No tigers, but there's mention of one or two penguins. So I'm just going to leave that there with you, get you a little excited for what's to come. I think it's probably safe to say today's guest is one of the most adventurous. She travels to some of the most remote places on the planet to capture the essence of parts of the world that most of us will never have a chance to visit. Her work is as much about escapism as it is about realism. And I hope today's episode helps you escape just a little bit from the reality that we're currently living in. Before we get into the interview, here's a little further context from myself and Evan. If you've still got a little gas in the tank after the interview, myself and Evan spend a couple of minutes chatting about our musings on the art world. So be sure to stay on for that. As always, if you're enjoying what we're doing at Radio Juxtapose, let us know. I really enjoy reading your messages and there's been some good suggestions for artists to get on future shows. Most of our interviews for the foreseeable future are going to be done over Skype. So if there's anyone that you think that you would love to hear on this show, then please do let us know and we'll see if we can wave a magic juxtapose wand over it and make it happen. That's enough for me. Let's crack on. This might be the weirdest intro we've ever done, but we talked landscaping with Crank, so uh, with Craig. So that's you know that was something that was so weird. Um, remarkable. Um, you know, actually, I, what I wanted to say to you when we first started this um, podcast with Zaria Foreman, um, who's the the person we interview for uh, episode forty three of Radio Juxtapose, um, was how we've actually got ourselves on this weird little path, almost by accident, but in a way it's, it's really great how it's coming about is artists working, uh, like the Felipe Pantone working with technology and science and trying to enhance his practice and being very positive about it. But this is where we really divert, but also kind of draw a connecting line of, um, science in a, in a, an approachable way on the podcast, which we've never done before. I think it's, I, I'm really, I'm really excited for people to listen to this. Zaria is such a, she's embedded, you know, she's embedded in the global, uh, in, in the global climate change conversation. She's embedded with scientists. She's embedded with just a wonderful technique as an artist. And she's such a good ambassador because she speaks so well because she doesn't pretend to be an expert in science, but she is kind of applying emotion to science, which I think is really cool. When she was included in Banksy's Dismal Land, I remember my whole entire in, like interpretation of her work changing. Cause I was like, Oh, you're right. If, like, duh, it is political by the nature of it. And it is speaking to such a political, um, moment, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the sort of bad legislation that, you know, governments keep practicing. Um, but I, I don't know why it just for so long, I kind of looked at the work as just this beautiful representations of, of the world, but that, that really changed my perception of it. And I think that's, um, that's great when that happens, when you, when you have these art experiences, um, that just kind of completely bring a artist's work to a whole different, uh, appreciation. And, you know, and I like how, when we talk to her about how you move forward with technique and all the things you want to be as an artist, but also have these trips and like what you document on those trips be the basis of your work. I thought that was cool the way she responded about that as well. 
So I'm in London. Evan, you're in San Francisco. I'm in San Francisco. And our guest today is Aria. In upstate New York. In the background of the screen, I can see a little... There's... Yeah, oh. there you go. Yeah, so yeah. All, all of that was totally white this morning when I woke up and it was snowing. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. We're like, we're like six weeks behind New York City. I don't know what's going on. We have one little bunch of daffodils in the back that's like, please, I'm ready. And then that's it. There's like nothing else happening. Yeah, we're, we're in like a weird microclimate. We're kind of up high on a hill and, and it's just, the snow is just relentless. <laughs> is this the normal studio for you? Or is this a place that you found to escape to? This, so this is a brand new, well, the house isn't brand new, but it's a new purchase that my boyfriend and I just bought right in the nick of time, unbeknownst to us. We closed in February and are very, very grateful to have this place to, to now take refuge in. We want to stay out of the city until it feels okay to be back. So where were you before? Were you, uh, were you sort of in the city and this is you fleeing? Or you, are you, do you just find yourself permanently in these places of space? Well, I, I do try to do that as much as I can. <laughs> Your work would suggest that you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was in my studio in Brooklyn, um, in my apartment in Brooklyn, um, working away towards a solo, my next solo exhibition on a very tight deadline. And I had gone, I had gone for a week to, to go skiing with some friends in Colorado. And then from there, I went to Norway to oversee the installation of a, um, a huge exhibition on an expedition cruise ship that I curated. Um, and so while I was in Norway, everything just started getting crazier and crazier. And all of a sudden they were like, nobody's coming back from Europe to the U S. And so uh, we cut our trip short and, um, came home a few days early. And then I just booked it right out of the city and came upstate and we didn't know how long we we're going to be here, but now it's, <laughs> it's we still don't know how long you're going to be there. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> yeah. I keep getting everyone that I'm speaking to is kind of giving me the, oh, we're, we're really, we're really feeling for you there in the city, you know? And I was like, oh, this, the tables have turned now, haven't they? The tables are turned. Everyone else in the sticks is winning this one. It's kind of crazy. I, I feel very grateful to have this space. And I, I have all these huge drawings in, in Brooklyn that are like halfway done. And I just shoved a few little pieces that like these two behind me into my car, whatever I could fit. And, and that's all I've got to, <laughs> to work on while I'm here. But you do seem like an artist that could work well with patience and a little bit of like the uncertainty of time. Uh, I assume like that's something that is part of the practice that you've perfected at, to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I certainly don't mind the slowdown, which this has provided. I'm loving it actually, to be honest. I, I yeah, I've, I've kind of like for the last um, I don't know, 20 years, I feel like I've just been like going, going, going like this hamster on a wheel and I've just been working too much. And so for the last few years, I've been trying to like slow down and really focus on making work that I enjoy making and that I'm not just trying to pump out for the next show. And um, so, yeah, it's been kind of nice, actually, I have to be honest, to have this time up here to just take it slow. Do you think that is actually happening and it's settling in with you? Because I've I think for a lot of people, it's like there was this almost this expectation that things wouldn't change, that they were still going to be operating at the same level in the same way that they were before. Have you made a conscious decision to to really let this make an abrupt change in direction for you? Yeah, well, I mean, I are thankfully. So the thing is, I hadn't made small pieces in a really, really long time, like years. And I decided to make a few small pieces for this upcoming show and I'm really glad that I did because I so I had like four that were kind of halfway done um and I wouldn't have even had those panels to bring up here had I not had I not decided to do that so but um oh there's a little dog on my porch <laughs> one, <laughs> one of yours <laughs> no that must be the neighbors I've, I've heard he's around but i hadn't seen him before <laughs> get him on <laughs> that's funny because we don't have we have like there's like nobody up here, but <laughs> let's go back to you. So where are you from originally? I'm from, um, I grew up in Piermont, New York, which is a tiny little town, just about 30 miles north of New York city. Okay. And in, in relation to where you are, is that sort of similar, similar area, similar landscape? It's a little less. Um, I mean, it's more developed down there for sure. I we're like really up in the sticks here. Mm. Um, we're about two hours north of like upper Manhattan. It takes me three hours from park slope. So um, in Brooklyn, so we're, we're basically an hour south of Albany, an hour north of Woodstock in kind of this little remote pocket that 
um, nobody seems to have heard of. It's it's a hamlet. It's too small to be considered a town. Wait, it's called yeah. Hamlet. It's called a hamlet. All the all the like oh. towns nearby are hamlets because they're too small to be considered an actual town. Right. Good. We haven't had Hamlet on the on this on this show yet, so this is a first for us. This, <laughs> no, is, a this big, is the first. It's a big moment. <laughs> and, and so, and your mother was a was a photographer, correct? Yeah, she was a landscape photographer. I actually have some of her pieces up. If, if you want, I can walk you around and see them. She. We loved traveling to the most remote places she could possibly find and where there were just no people around and pure pristine landscape. And so we traveled a lot as a family growing up ever since I was pretty young. And that that definitely played a huge role in like in my own appreciation for nature and the outdoors and landscape and and certainly set me on the on the path that I that I've been on. <laughs> was that from a from an art or an environmental activist point of view which was your first love as it were i would say more art at least my mom didn't really focus on the environmental impacts at that at the time towards the very end of her career she did because we started we went to um the arctic first time i ever went to the arctic and saw icebergs and glaciers was was with my family and it's it was pretty hard to ignore you know the subject of climate change traveling to a place like greenland this was back in 2007 um, when we, like we weren't really talking about climate change in the United States or probably Europe either, <laughs> um, as we are today. But in a place like Greenland, it was like basically a topic of discussion every single day. Um, all the people that were staying at the same hotel that we were at were either like newscasters coming to write about the ice or scientists coming to study it. Um, and so it was just very, very apparent. And that's what opened my eyes to the climate crisis and and um, why I decided to shift my focus very specifically towards that. My mom was more, you know, more focused on the, the meditative qualities of nature, the pristine beauty and the kind of serenity that it allows and that it offers. And, and so I think tra up until that first trip to the Arctic, it was really more about just like the beauty and the respite that nature offers and, and just having the chance to, to sit and be in nature and experience it and, um, and really like, soak it in. What do you remember about that first sort of experience being in a place like Greenland? I mean, it was, it was remarkable. It was like nowhere else I'd ever been. So the first kind of phrases that always come to mind are like otherworldly and, um, you know, felt like I was on another planet, which it, it kind of did. But it's very, very real and very much our planet, um, just a part that not many people get to see in a lifetime because they are so remote and you know, not on our like normal travel list. <laughs> I love that idea that something that's completely untouched could be ever described as unworldly. Coming from a city where this is unworldly. Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. That's that's a really good point. Yeah, cities are like the least <laughs> natural thing you could possibly yeah, find on Earth. But, but us, that's it's... what we know. Yeah, it was really just a breathtaking experience to see glaciers and icebergs for the first time in that trip. That very first trip to Greenland was one I will absolutely never forget. We just, we took out, um, we stayed right right on the water in this place called Alulasat, where um, the town is situated right next to one of the largest glaciers in the Arctic. And it's dispensing, I think like 10% of all the icebergs in the Arctic um, come from that one glacier. It's like been said that the, that the iceberg that sunk the Titanic probably came from it. Um, so it just dumps all these huge chunks of ice into the bay and then they, and then they like twirl by your window <laughs> when you're, when you're in a hotel right on the shore there. And we would take a little boat out every day at sunset, which lasted a few hours in the Arctic. It was just so spectacular. There would be this like layer of mist kind of blurring the horizon line between the water and the, and the ice. And it just, it really felt very dreamlike. Like all my memories of that trip feel like it was just so ephemeral, you know. I like the idea of like a celebrity glacier in that way. It's it might have been the one that, that dropped that, <laughs> a celebrity that, that, glacier. That, I it was what's interesting is like you're talking about like how like the beauty of nature and almost the artistry that can come from just observing nature, but also like when does when did like the interactions with scientists start coming in? Was it on this Greenland trip or like when did that kind of part of your practice start be, like veering its head a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where it began, but I was, I was mostly interested in the beauty of these places and, and just capturing the visuals up until, um, I mean, there was always, I guess, an under, an, excuse me, an undertone of science because it was about climate change. And I would talk about that in my artist statements and I would learn as much as I could. But 
Um, it really wasn't until I was invited to fly with NASA, um, an operation that they called IceBridge that they were running for about um, a little over a decade. I th I, I'm not sure if they've stopped now. I mean, they're not going now, obviously, but what they were doing basically was flying over both poles, um, measuring the ice with many different instruments that they have on the aircraft. Um, to study the changes in the ice over time. So they would fly over the exact same pl flight plan year after year. And I had the opportunity to fly with them over several of them, bo um, both in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And that was just an experience like no other, like I never had before really for many reasons. First of all, like getting a whole different perspective of the ice. You know, I was used to seeing it like from the ground perspective. And so getting to see it from like 1500 feet above, we were fly flying pretty low over the ice for just like miles and miles day after day. We'd, we'd be on like eight hour flights um, day after day. And, uh, and then just having all that time too in the air to just talk to the scientists because, you know, yeah. we'd just be on a, on a big, pr pretty empty plane. You know, there were just, there were lots of instruments. There were an infrared sensor, um, digital photography, and something called a gravimeter, which me measures gravity. There was, you know, there were, there would be like, hours on end where we'd be flying over what to me looked pretty boring visually so like I, you know I wasn't shooting photos out the window all the time and I could just sit down next to a scientist and start asking him okay like what what is this what are, what are you doing what does this mean and what are we looking at and or I could show them photos that I had taken out the window of the cockpit and be like what's happening with this ice here like why does it look like that and and so it just it just really deepened my own understanding of ice and the way that it is built up and the way that it breaks down um, and the way that it melts and creates forms and different shapes along the way. So, so I did a whole, I made a whole body of work that was about that trip um, or about those trips that I took with them. I feel like I'll still probably continue that for many more years to come, but, um, but it was, it was a really educational experience and I had, you know, the opportunity to kind of like write descriptions of every single piece that I drew, like what, so that, so that you as a viewer could understand what you're looking at. Cause they look, pretty abstract compared to my other work. You wouldn't necessarily know that you're looking at ice, but I drew exactly what I saw out the window. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of offer like a little bit of the story so people could relate to what they were looking at and understand it a little better. When did the painting begin? Um, yeah, well, so I always loved charcoal when I was, when I was a child just growing up and um, drawing was always my medium, pens you know, graphite and charcoal. It's hard to say when it began, probably just like when I could hold a crayon <laughs> in my fingers. <laughs> my mom, you know, as, as we said, was an artist. And so we just like always had art supplies around the house. And I went to, I went to very artsy schools, Waldorf school growing up. And, and then didn't even really think I wanted to do it professionally until it was kind of happening. <laughs> it's funny. I just was like, well, I'm an artist. Like that's part of me, but I just didn't think that I wanted to do it professionally not because I didn't think it was viable. You know, my parents were very supportive of whatever I wanted to do, but I just, you know, I loved a few different things and I, I ended up majoring in art in college and then went on to continue making drawings right out of college, but I was also making jewelry and selling it and did my yoga teacher training course and was teaching yoga classes. I kind of did all these three things that I loved and the art just kept like taking off more than the rest and, until it took up all my time and I had to <laughs> stop the other things and and then it was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is definitely what I'm supposed to be doing. I just didn't realize it until then. So it wasn't necessarily like one clear direction that you were naturally going in and then art came in. It was just kind of like there's a couple of things in the pot and art was the yeah. one that art was the one that just kind of consistently kept yeah. giving. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really what happened. And I still miss, the, you know, making other things. And I taught yoga for a really long time. I only quit about, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I was teaching for like 10 years, just at the end, it was just one class a week, just to kind of like keep myself in the practice and, and, you know, be there for my students once a week. But in the end, it just became like, you know, I'd be working on a show and I'm like, shit, I gotta go teach yoga this week. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's not the energy I want to be bringing to a yoga class. So I think it's time, it's time to cut that out. <laughs> Would we recognize the work that you were making in school? Um, maybe. I, I mean, I, I definitely see like my my senior year is where I kind of see where my work began in a way. Like it sort of stopped looking like studies from classes and more like actual work that I wanted to be making. I did, I did an independent study both um, semesters of my senior year. Cause I, 
what, what happened was I didn't take my first art class until second semester sophomore year at Skidmore College because I was just like, oh, the classes are three hours long. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> I don't know why. I just like didn't, didn't do it. And I was focusing on theater. I thought I wanted to be a theater major. And then um, when I finally took my first class, it was form and design. It was like a, basically sculpture 101. And I'm terrible with 3D. And I still loved it. And I was like, okay, so this, it just became very clear to me, like, this is what I need to be doing. I don't know why I was wasting my time doing theater this whole time. I tried to kind of like jump past drawing 101 and 102 because I had been drawing my whole life and, and it was just very much a part of me. And I knew perspective and I knew all those basic things, but the school gave me a really hard time and I just was never able to to jump up and I ended up being like the example in every class like the teacher would always be like look at Zarya's that's how you want it to look and um so it sort of felt like a waste of time for a little while by the time I got to my senior year I was like I just want to do what I want to do and um so that's why I chose to do this independent study and I could just choose what professor I wanted to to do the critiques with and and that's where I really started doing these like huge um stormy skies tumultuous skies tornadoes and hurricanes and and they, they were pretty large. Like my, I made two for my senior year exhibition that were six by eight feet, I think. Um, I don't know if you'd recognize them, but you, you might. I mean, they're, they're, they're different, very different from what I'm doing now, but you can kind of see the progression. It's weird that you were doing tumultuous work then, because now you're kind of doing tumultuous work, but like you're doing like this kind of like peaceful sort of frozen moment of a tumultuous time and a tumultuous like end of the natural world in, in certain ways, but like, it's not tornadoes. That's interesting. Yeah. You went in like a different tumultuous direction. I've always been drawn toward moody scenes. Like I, oftentimes I'll make a bright blue sky gray. Um, you know, I, I just tend to like, I'm drawn more towards those scenes that are a little bit softer and a little less like bright and sunshiny. And, um, and it's funny because it's not really my character. Like people are always like, oh, that's where your dark side is. It comes out in your art. Like I'm just normally like a happy person. But yeah, I think if you, if you look at the progression of the work, you can, you can see where like I, my first, that first trip to Greenland I was talking about before, I was, you know, planning on making work of that place. And I focused all of my image, all of my photographs on the sky. Cause I was like, well, I'm not going to draw ice. I just didn't think I was capable of it. And so I was looking at the clouds the whole time and I got home and I was like, well, I'm actually really interested in the water and I had these little strips of water at the bottom of every photo and and um, I omitted the ice for five years I was just like no I don't think I can do it pastel is white is really tricky and hard to blend with other colors and I just didn't think it was possible I was so used to doing these like really nebulous forms not like sharp edges and lines so that's where my interest started turning into water which I think is a little bit more like you see the forms a little bit more specifically than 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 clouds and storms that are just a little bit more smudged. And so I think that's what got me more and more comfortable. Like the more I learned about water, the more I got comfortable with those sharp edges. And then five years of making excuses of why I wasn't drawing ice in my work about climate change. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I went back to Greenland with like a really focused intention to, to make drawings about ice. I focused, focused all my photographs on the ice and, and, um, and then I've been making those drawings ever since. That was 2000, 2012. Wait, when you say you're making drawings, are you talking about a, like the, the initial sketches? Because you see, keep saying drawings. And then when I look at your work, I say paintings. Is this just like yeah. semantics or like what? I think, yeah, it's just semantics. It's, okay. it's, a common, okay. it's a common thing that people are like, wait, I don't get it. I call them drawings because it's soft pastel. So they're, it's really dry. It's basically charcoal. Same thing. It's charcoal, just colors. So, and I'm using my hands and pretty much no other tools, just my hands and the, and the pastels. So to me saying painting feels like I'm lying. Like I'm not using a paintbrush. It's not oh, paint okay. Wet. All right. <laughs> I said painting earlier. I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. It's not wrong. <laughs> it's actually not wrong. Like my gallery calls them paintings and they argue that like, well, if it's pigment, then it's a painting. So I, I think technically painting is correct. Well, you know how like the art world, like you, it's like if you say drawing, it's a bad word or something, you know, as opposed to it's like this. I was just ma making. I'm trying to change everything. that. <laughs> okay. All right. In one of the interviews I listened to, the speaker, in fact, I think it was yourself as well. You had referred to, you know, uh, nobody makes pastel paintings on of that scale. As a non-artist, I wanted to know why 
Because it's stupid. Okay, thanks. That's the answer I was looking for. We can move on. Perfect. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> It really is. I, the, I do know one other artist who, um, uh, who I've always admired, whose work I, I've always admired, Robert Longo, who you guys probably know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he makes really large scale uh, charcoal drawings. I don't know if he uses anything else other than black charcoal, but there might be others that I don't know that I'm unaware of, but it's just, it's such a vulnerable medium. It's impossible to fix it completely. It's also on paper, which is a vulnerable, you know, substrate, is that the right word? <laughs> um, surface. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's just, it's just kind of idiotic. Like I, there were, there were so many years I look back at that, you know, early in my career before I could afford to, um, mount the paper onto dye bond, which is what I do now. Cause it's, so it's like a hard surface. I used to just like roll the drawings up and ship them to the framer and they would inevitably get like smudged or ruined a little bit along the way. Um, I also had to like carry them three stories down from my apartment to take them outside to spray fix them. And it would, I, I mean, I would always like call over at my tallest guy friend to come help me like bring a six foot drawing down three flights of stairs around the corners and like, you know, and then a gust of wind would come up when I'm outside spraying and like I've had pieces rip in half because they were like push pin oh. boards. And it's just been a nightmare. Um, and now I can afford a more expensive route, but it's still, now it's just like really expensive because everything has to be framed immediately. It has to go behind glass. And so that just, you know, makes everything exponentially more expensive. But I don't know. I'm just in love with it and I can't stop. So. <laughs> but you, it, it tells the story. I mean, you just, the way you explained it, it kind of tells the story too. I mean, it's part of, it's all connected from the way you, in, you know, conceptualize the work or document the work to making it. It kind of all works and it should be a little difficult in that case. Yeah. yeah I mean, and it, in, in some ways too, it kind of like references the subject matter and, and mm. the way that it's, it's ephemeral. It's ever changing. It's, not it's vulnerable and yeah i didn't do that on purpose but <laughs> but it works for a press release midway through a work you're like why do i do it this way hour 150 on one work you're just like i can't i just yeah <laughs> with these trips that you've you've done was this just like a natural continuation from when you were doing them as a child with your family how did you get to this point where you're an independent artist doing these trips were they all you know for yourself self-funded you know this is my trip or was it with you know support from organizations or something like this yeah it was kind of a, a mixture um so at first well I'll go back and tell you about my mom first because that seems the most relevant to, place to start she she would always you know I always took these trips with my family and in 2011 my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer and passed away pretty quickly, like six months, six months later. How old were you at this point? I was 29. This was like seven, seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. Yeah, I think I was 29. When I, when I first learned that she wasn't going to make it, I like, I thought that that was the end of my traveling days. I was like, okay, well, I, I just didn't think I had it in me to like, to, to plan and to like undertake the kind of trips that she, she did. Yeah, I just so I just was like, well, that that sucks. I mean, obviously for many other reasons, didn't drop it. <laughs> yeah, that that was the part you focused on. <laughs> <laughs> that was the part I focused on. It was the first thing that came to mind. No, but what happened was I was in the middle of planning a trip with her to go back to Greenland um, for a second time, um, and it was her, her idea for the trip was to mirror this trip that had happened in 1869, which was led by an American painter named William Bradford, um, and he had. He had, it was the first Arctic art expedition that had ever happened, like the first expedition to the Arctic that, whose main purpose was art as opposed to science or exploration, which is mainly what was happening then. And so my mom thought it would be really cool to like follow in their footsteps and mirror their path up the northwest coast of Greenland and seek inspiration from the same landscape almost 150 years after they had been there. Um, and so we were kind of in the early stages of planning the trip when she was diagnosed with cancer and then passed away. But like during, during those months of her illness, she was so dedicated to the trip and still so obsessed with it. Like every day she would wake up and talk about how like she needs to order her film. We need to like book the boat. We need to like get the passenger, you know, we need to invite the people. So she just kept like talking about it every single day. And it became clear to me, you know, before she died that I had to carry, carry this trip out in her honor. Um, so that was my, that was that trip 
that I mentioned going back to Greenland the second time five years after I had been there with her. And I went, I spread her ashes there amidst the ice as she had, she had requested. Um, and I was pretty terrified to, to plan that trip. Like I just, it felt like a lot, but I, I just felt like I had no choice. Mm. Um, and I think it was one of the biggest gifts that my mom left me because, because going through that and, and undertaking that made, and, and, you know, succeeding, I guess, um, it made me realize that I, that I could do that on my own. And so that kind of like gave me the confidence I didn't have before to undertake trips from then on. Um, so I got back from Greenland. I made a whole body of work from that trip. And then, and then I was like, Oh, I really, I just had an idea to go to the Maldives because I wanted to kind of theoretically follow the melt water from the ice to the equator where it was drowning the lowest lying island nation in the world. And, and I was still like a poor starving artist at that point. And, and, um, but my mom always taught me, you just put things out in the universe and they'll happen. <laughs> and, um, she was really good at that. And so I like tried to harness that from her and, um, and I had this idea, I wanted to go to the Maldives and then like I sold a painting for $5,000 and I went. <laughs> You're like, this is it. This is the sign. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, like I, I hadn't been to Antarctica yet and I really wanted to go and I, you know, I knew there are cruise ships that go down there. I know it's like $10,000 a person at least. Um, if you're paying for it. And I thought, well, I could probably get on as like an artist in residence. I'm going to just put that out in the universe. And then like, boom, I met the CEO of the company I wanted to go with in an elevator in Manhattan. <laughs> so It's just like, I don't know. I think my mom taught me how to just like manifest these things when you really want them. Did your mom also teach you to like, you know, when we go on these trips, like just to be active, active participant on these trips as well. And like, not just go and observe, but observe, document. And like, it seems like your mom passed along this like really great work ethic of when you're on these trips, like it's a work trip as well as an experience. Like there seems to be, that's some, that's something that is, I mean, hard sometimes for people to be like, oh, I'm here to work as well as experience yeah. this. That's an interesting yeah. balance. No, that's a hundred percent true. I like, Growing up just from being from a very early age, all of our trips pretty much were for her work. So it was always like it never felt like a vacation. I mean, it felt like a vacation to us, but it was like she was always working. We were always her assistants. We were carrying her equipment. We were like unrolling her film. We were writing down her notes in her journal. We were like doing all the things. We were like her little worker bees. And so by the time I was making my own drawings and still going on the family trips, I like it was sort of my excuse that I didn't have to be her assistant because I was, I was doing my own work. <laughs> I'm not really carrying that stuff anymore. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, not I what I'm doing. Graduated. No, no more. <laughs> I was amazed how well that actually worked. Like my sister still had to carry all her, her gear around and I was like, well, I'm doing my own work. I don't Do you know where that came from? Like, was her mom, was your mom's mom, your grand, was she into like adventure and exploration? Do you know like where, how far back this kind of, that, that drive goes? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I don't know. I mean, my, her, her mother um, had a very difficult life. She was in the Holocaust and her, almost her entire family died. She, she basically made it out alone as a teenager and made her way to New York and, and started um, advocating for UJA, for United Jewish Association and raising money for people who had, who had been in the, through the war. Um, so she was, she had, she had a really tough life and was, you know, psychologically fucked up, of course. And, um, and I don't know, yeah, my mom grew up on the Upper West Side with her and as an only child, and maybe she just like didn't actually get that sense of adventure. And maybe that's why she kind of wanted to, to just break out. Like, I think she kind of went very opposite. It was a rebellion for her? From her upbringing, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, that's, it's a question though. I'm not sure where that came from. She just, she always said that she was like born in the wrong century. My mom, like she thought she should have been a 19th century photographer. She always like sepia toned her, her images um, to look like 19th century landscape photos. And she, she always, she was obsessed with like early 19th century photographers. And um, yeah, I, I don't know where that came from. Since then, are you, have you developed a comfort in these scenarios going out, sitting in a little boat? I've watched some footage of you on YouTube sitting in a tiny little boat in front of, you know, these huge 
like dominating glaciers, icebergs. And I, I'm not going to lie, like, you know, I, I, I consider myself an adventurous guy. I'd be terrified as some guys pulling out penguin heads from the thing, from the, from the ocean and there's like water coming down everywhere. It was like, this is terrifying. So are you, are you, are you just naturally comfortable in these positions now or is it still a little intimidating? Depends on the trip, but I feel like I've always been with experts and so I felt safe and comfortable because they know what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, the most dangerous place I've ever been was probably flying with NASA in, you know, over the most remote places in Antarctica. <clears throat> so remote that if we were to go, have something go wrong and have to crash land, the chances of our, the chances of us surviving a crash landing were so, so slim. But even if we did, nobody would be able to rescue us because it's just too far for a helicopter to get there. But, you know, they'd have to refuel on the way and they wouldn't be able to get, you know, like places that remote. And I didn't even know that that was the case until we landed our last flight. <laughs> and, and Oh, they didn't tell you at the time? No. like I, asked. Smart move. <laughs> Someone asked. I like that. Somebody finally asked, so was this dangerous? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you never brought it up. Why would I'm we really tell glad. you? <laughs> I'm really glad nobody ever asked before that because I would have been, I would have been terrified, but we're like, we're still like, we're with the safest, like top, most top notch pilots on the planet. You know, they were all like fighter jet pilots and, you know, from, from Air Force and whatnot. And, and so they really like, they were, we were in the best hands we possibly could have been in. Um, and same with going to Antarctica, you, you can't really get there without, without experts <laughs> um, because it is a very unsafe place to be. And it's very um, dangerous and you have to know what you're doing. You have to know how to navigate ice. You have to know like, um, you know, even about just like the animals there like places in, in Svalbard where we've been, you can't leave settlements without someone who has a rifle um, cause of the polar bears. <laughs> and I don't know, it's just always been fun for me. I've never felt, I've never felt scared. Explaining science to the layman is always proven to be quite difficult. Explaining art to everybody tends to be quite difficult. So when you're on these trips and it's like, was there ever any suspicion that they had towards you or it was, or was the conversation always really open and kind of free flowing at all times? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I was terrified to go, yeah, I wasn't terrified on the airplane, but I was terrified before I met up with them. Because <laughs> I was like, I was like, here's me, this like stupid little artist from New York City who's going to meet NASA pilots and scientists and like and fly with them. Like, what are they gonna think of me? They're probably gonna laugh in my face. And like, I, you know, I'm not, I don't have a scientific mind at all. Um, so I was really nervous and intimidated and the first, and I also thought that it was like maybe a hoax. Like I was like, why am I being invited <laughs> to fly with NASA? <laughs> it's like up until the minute I like entered my first science meeting after I got to the hotel um, where everybody was staying, I was like, this still could be like a massive like kidnapping or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not even a fun hoax, a kidnapping. I thought like an elaborate prank. What happens if we take a New Yorker and put him in Antarctica? What happens? It's like, a, it's like, it's an experiment beyond experiments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, but I was really like, all of that was dispelled. The, the first, like the minute I met everyone, I went, I walked into this, like, there was like a science meeting at six o'clock every night. And you know, the day we arrived, they're like, come to the meeting and meet everyone. And the first thing that happened was a few people were like, I know your work. I recognize you and I love your work. And I was like, really? Wow. I didn't think you were all just so friendly and so appreciative and like happy to have me there, which I was not expecting at all. And I, I think it was just maybe refreshing for them to have someone who wasn't a scientist aboard, on board and um, to get to answer the silly questions. And they really also, I think, strongly recognized the need for help, the help of communicating the work that they were doing and the, the data that they were collecting because they'd been doing this by the time I met up with them, they'd been doing it for eight years and like what had changed in our policies and what has, you know, what are we doing to solve this crisis? Practically nothing. So I think no matter what their politics were, they, they all recognized the strong need to communicate the data that they were collecting. And that's what I was there to do. And they knew that. Um, so I think they just, were appreciative and wanted to help me in any way that that they could, which was which was really great. I'm still I still email with them and ask them questions, and they're always just so helpful and and wonderful in that way. 
Well, I think you said in your TED talk, you and I mean, I'm summarizing, but you said something about like how you're kind of developing people's like emotional connection to the environment that science can't quite do. Yeah, that that's basically the core purpose of my work, I think. I recognize that, I mean, psychology tells us that art has the ability to tap into our emotions and we as human beings take action and make decisions based on our emotions more than literally anything else. I'm able to tap into your emotions by like standing in front of a drawing that I've made in any way that, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have to be a specific way. It just can move you in some way, ideally in the direction of falling in love with these places as I have and, and therefore wanting to protect them because you want to protect what you love. But literally anything, like having any kind of feeling for these places that are really like otherwise completely distant and far off and not a part of our everyday lives, but yet are at the forefront of climate change and have so much to do with, you know, everything else that's changing on our planet that's affecting all of us. Do you think then that the art in general um, can bridge this gap between those that don't have the chance to make these emotional connections firsthand? I mean, I don't know if it's like the one and only answer, but it's definitely a part, you know, it can, it can play a role. I think we all react and like take action differently. Like some of us need to be scared into action. Some of us need to see those terrifying photographs and videos of forest fires and um, of like a glacier crumbling. But some of us like me, I think, respond more to a positive message like showing the beauty of these places and what we stand to lose so i'm yeah i'm just trying to play my one little role in in helping to solve the crisis but i think we need we need everything we need all hands on deck in your experience talking about this stuff do you think people get overwhelmed with the just the concept of climate change absolutely i think we're our brains are like wired for that it's just like way too big of a problem to to feel like we can wrap our heads around it. Um, and that's part of the problem. That's part of the pro I think that's a huge reason why we are not moving fast enough to help solve this crisis because it just feels so overwhelming and too big that we're like, I, and, and also like way in the future, even though it's not, um, it's like this very slow moving train wreck. When you, when you first visited Greenland and then revisited five, seven years later, what was the biggest change that you noticed personally? You know, I don't think I noticed, to be honest, I don't think I noticed that much change between the five years I had been there. Um, I remember seeing there, there was a glacier that looked like it had receded a little bit, but it's hard to tell if you're not going back at the exact same time of year to really say like, oh, I saw a huge, like there was, there's a bay there that can be chock full of ice one day and then the wind blows it all out the next day. And so you can sure. kind of make these like anecdotal things about it. But I think the real, um, the real change that like, I, I guess, learned about is from the NASA scientists because they were flying over the exact same flight paths year after year and they could literally see the difference with their eyes. They didn't need to look at the data. And so it was mostly like my conversations with them that, um, that were the most eye-opening in that regard. Um, I mean, there's still like a lot of places in the Arctic and, and Antarctica that you can visit and see like, oh, there's like markers where the glacier used to be five mm -hmm. years ago or, or just talking to the locals. Like, I think that's really where the stories come from not from, from my own experience, just going back like at random times, a few years apart. Can you maybe uh, just talk a little bit about what it's like speaking to the locals in these really, really remote places? Yeah, you know, what's, right. their, what's their kind of attitude towards everything, whether it's, you know, seeing tourism exist, whether it's seeing glaciers change, whether it's, you know, in action, what's their kind of general response? Yeah, I mean, it's different everywhere. I wouldn't generalize any of the stories, but I would say, you know, my first experience traveling in Greenland, the, the stories from the locals were probably the most eye-opening. I mean, definitely what I learned from the scientists there too, but, um, but they were the ones really seeing the changes year after year and, um, and the ones who are having to adapt their lifestyle practically on a daily basis in order to deal with these changes. Like they're, they're, they're subsistence hunters. Like most of the people that live in Greenland are subsistence hunters. And sorry, can you just uh, yeah? What's that mean? Can you can you elaborate what that phrase means for those that don't know? <laughs> sorry, that means <laughs> they that means they hunt for their food um, as opposed to buying it in a grocery store. Yeah, and so the hunting grounds are primarily the fjords when they freeze over. I remember them saying a few a few people told me that like summertime is considered boring in Greenland because the fjords 
melts and you can't dog sled from one place to another to another town. So you can't like go visit your friends because you can't get there <laughs> unless you have a boat, which a lot of them don't because it's gas is expensive, boats are expensive. But the winter time is like the most fun, even though it's very dark and cold and snowy and icy. But the so yeah, so the fjords are their primary um, hunting grounds and the, one of the biggest changes I heard about from the locals was just like the fjords aren't freezing over anymore in the winter time, and so they can't they can't get to their hunting grounds. And if they don't have a boat or money to buy one, um, they're you know what are they going to do? It's really it's really a challenge. And then there were like I would say in the Maldives, it, the the story seemed very different to me. A, a lot of the people, I mean, again, it varied from conversation to conversation, but I would I was surprised by how many. Um, people I talked to, locals I talked to, kind of denied the, what was happening. Like they maybe understood that climate change was a thing, but they were like, oh, the Maldives is too far. You know, it's, it's not going to disappear. Like that's not going to happen. Um, and I, what I took away from that, I don't know if this was the case, but it kind of seemed like, I mean, I, I can't understand, I could never understand the concept of like my home disappearing. Mm-hmm. Like that just feels crazy to me because it's something you've always known has existed and it's your home and it's like like I, just thinking about that changing so drastically would i think be really hard for someone especially if home is like not just a physical building it's it's a patch of land it's a country it was interesting you- to hear about but, you know but then there's like a lot of environmental groups that are like working really hard to educate people to try and make a plan to to you know move with integrity and and not like in the midst of a disaster, of a tsunami or something. And um, so it, yeah, it really, it really varies from person to person. Do you think that's an education thing? Yeah, uh, for sure. I would think so. Um, their government is a mess. <laughs> um, okay. We were, we, they were Wait. in the middle of a, of a political, what do you call it? Um, coup. <laughs> there was a coup like while we were there during an election year and we had to leave the mainland because it was dangerous and it was, yeah, it was, it was intense. I'm sure their education and um, political situation is just, they're getting lots of mix, mixed messages. And yeah, I was always wondering too, cause like obviously the politics of climate change is just like we could go on. That could be a five, six, that could be the podcast of the century, but the, the backdrop of, of you living in one of the most densely populated places in the world and like going on these trips and then going back into New York City, was New York City and being in such a densely populated place, was that really important for you to come back from these trips and create this work that's like the opposite of that? I mean, how does that, how did that work in your practice? Because it feels like that would be like jarring to me. Yeah, it's always jarring. It's always really, especially because when I travel, especially for work, it tends to be for at least four weeks at a time. So that's a good amount of time to kind of like just yeah. get comfortable and really feel like you forgot that there's a New York City out there. <laughs> comfortable in the in the Antarctic, of course. Yes. So comfortable. <laughs> but yeah, so every time I came home, it was always kind of like culture shock. But at the same time, when you're gone for a month, you get you start to get a little homesick and you're like ready to kind of go back to like a routine and having your creature comforts. And so it's a mixture of things. But I would say that it's always kind of nice to have the work in my studio and to work on every day that kind of in a way like takes me out of the city and just mentally like I can bring myself back to that moment in time where I was on that boat as the light shifted and like shone on the iceberg and that part you know that part that I'm drawing so that's always been nice for me I think in general I'm definitely a nature person although I do love living in the city too and I love being close to all my friends um I, I've in the last couple of years, I've been, I mean, that's why we just bought this house. Like I want to have nature be more a part of my everyday right. life. And, and I live right by Prospect Park and Park Slope, which is kind of my sanctuary. My, the sanctuary. Way, yeah. 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 It's like the way that I can stay in the city, but, but I also grew up, you know, I grew up just outside the city and going into the city all the time with my mom to look at art and just like soak up the culture yeah. that it offers. So I, that part is really important to me too. And I can't see myself ever living completely without it. So just find that. Then- like, let's say you go on a trip and as a, as an artist who wants to explore a new technique and you come back from a trip and you're like, oh, I didn't take any photos. That's going to allow me to try this new technique. Do, does that ever happen? Yeah, it always happens. It happens okay. like every single, it happens okay. every single right. time. I feel like, <laughs> cause I am always kind of look. I never know what I'm going to find in the next body of work. So I'm always focusing on the things that I liked in the last body of work. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm into this. So that I'm going to look at like that first time I went to Greenland, I was like, 
looking at the sky the whole fucking time. Yeah. And I omitted the ice from all of my drawings. And, I, and then I got home and I was like, wait, I'm really interested in the water actually. And I had like two pictures of water. <laughs> so, so that usually happens. Usually like I find that one thing, that new texture, that new surface that I'm interested yeah. in learning how to draw. And, um, and there's like never enough of it in, in the footage that I got. Um, so the last, the last like, um, I don't know, four or so trips, I've just tried to like not focus as much on composition or specific things, but just like, just document as much as I can, both with my eyes and my memory and my camera as much as possible, just to get it all so that I have as much information as I as I possibly can when I get home. It makes the whole editing process a lot harder, but. I don't even want to know your editing process. That seems like such a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, fun. The worst is the NASA stuff because I had, I had all of my own photos that I took like out the window. Um, but then I had hard drives that they gave me of all the photos that they, they have a camera that's strapped to the belly of the plane and it shoots pictures downward every three or two seconds. So every single eight hour flight, you know, they've got like hundreds of thousands of photos. And so I dumped all of the images from all the, the trips I was on and even some that I w weren't on that looked really beautiful to me that they were like, hey, you should take this, it's really nice. So I, I had like, I don't know, something like 500,000 photos to go through when I got home and, wow. and I could like fill the rest of my lifetime with making drawings from that series. But it's also, um, it was also a hard series to work on, so I needed to take a break. <laughs> when you have that reference image in your hand, whether it's a physical image or a digital, to what extent are you trying to directly reflect what your experience was, what that landscape looked like, and then where does artistic license come into play? Good question. I um, generally try to draw exactly what I saw in the landscape. So I try to like be as true to the landscape as I possibly can to give the viewer the experience that I had as close as I can, you know, recreate it. So there's that and that's always like the the overall theme for me. And then occasionally I will um, edit things and change them a little bit from photo to drawing just to create what feels like a balanced composition. So like I'll maybe change the shape of the ice just a little bit or um, like I said before, like make a bright blue sky moody gray, just because I prefer that. Um, but, and sometimes I mix and match a few different photos. Like if I want an iceberg, but I didn't quite get the whole thing in one picture, I'll like use a few different photos to put it together. Um, but I'd say like pretty much 90, 95% of the time, I'm depicting the exact scene that I witnessed. Cool. That's good. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was kind of where I thought it was going to go. In a, in a different note, what's the biggest difference for you between the North Pole and the South Pole? Oh, good question, Doug. That's a good one. This is always a hard one for me because I'm like, well, they're so different, but they're also really the same. <laughs> they're, they are really two totally different experiences. I would say, okay, maybe the biggest difference is the shape of the ice. In, because in Greenland, you get these like, you get these like cathedral shaped icebergs. But I don't, the thing that you don't get in the Arctic that you do get in the Antarctic are these tabular icebergs, which are, there's just so much more ice down south than there is up in the north. I don't, don't quote me on that. I don't know if that's actually true, but it seems like it. <laughs> but you said it with such conviction. <laughs> I did, didn't I? Um, I mean, I believe you. I have no other choice at this point. So, you know, yeah. you know what someone, I think someone different? will correct you on, 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 on the yeah, internet. That's, what, that's what the internet loves to do. I know. But, you know, I think the difference is, um, and I'm pretty sure this is right, is that most of the ice in the Arctic is on land, and most of the ice in the Antarctic is not. It's off, so it, the glaciers come down the mountain, but then they go for like miles over the ocean. And so you get these tabular icebergs that you don't really see in the Arctic, which means like they're like giant rectangles. Um, I mean, they're bigger than that, but you don't see 90% under the water. So mm -hmm. it looks like a huge like city block, just like a chunk. <laughs> um, and you can ride along, like there was one that we saw in my first trip to Antarctica that we rode along for like 15 miles. Um, and it just looks, it's, it's, it's amazing. And there, it feels like you're just in like an ice kingdom. Like there's just ice all around you. And it's like, some of them are like these big city block size chunks that are just like flat rectangles. And some are like, 
Superman's lair that have been, nice. if they've been, you know, if they break off and they've been sculpted by the wind and the water for any amount of time, they turn into these incredible shapes that just like, and you see blues that you never thought existed. And I could never recreate in pastel. I've been trying for years, but <laughs> making these colors with the pastel company, but we just can't ever get there. It's so vibrant. Yeah, I mean, your work is is incredibly blue and vibrant. And I actually, I actually almost thought there was a degree of artistic license being taken on that. And then I kind of looked back through, you know, the, the videos and stuff like that. And it was like, no, this is like, this is what it is there. It's, it looks like it pops, you know? Yeah, at first I was toning it down and because I just thought it was going to look like I made it up and it just didn't look real. So I would like gray them, gray the colors a little. And then in, in the most recent years, I was like, no, like that's not the point. Like the point of my work is to try and show people what it actually looks like. So why am I dulling it down? I just didn't want people to think it was fake and that I was like overdoing it. So now I try and I can't quite get there, but, I, but it's close. <laughs> Are penguins as cool as they look? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they never get old. Are those are those your favorite animals of all your trips are the penguins? Oh, probably. Yeah, cuz they're just so, they're so entertaining and they're so yeah. funny and they're so cute they're and curious and they come right up to you and like they really stink though. The the colonies really stink. Oh, really? Um, yeah, cuz there's like the their poop is everywhere and it just it just reeks like you have to hold your hand over your nose it's so bad but but if you're if you're not near the edge of the colony there can still be a bunch of penguins walking around and you're not in a dirty smell <laughs> they masked that very well in the film up oh, no it wasn't up it was happy feet sorry it was happy feet you, you don't get the sense that they stink in that film see i have to say though the elephant seals might they might be the penguins when they're um the only time i've been to antarctica is in the fall and if you're there in early in the season, so like November um, or early December, they you get to see um, this. Well, I'm oh, sorry, this is South Georgia, actually, not Antarctica. Although they're probably in Antarctica too, but they're just there's the elephant seal pups, and elephant seals are so huge. So their babies are like, what happens is they're they're born, and their mothers just feed them. They chalk full chalk them full of milk for like three weeks and they grow into these like four to six hundred pound babies and then their moms leave and they never come back and so they leave them on the beach and they're stuck there and they don't know how to they don't know how to um swim yet or like fish and so they just kind of hang out on the beach until they figure it out but they're so full of milk that they like don't need to for a little while and so you you get on the beach and they're like they've got these huge black eyes and they they look at you and they're like mom <laughs> and they're like, oh, do you, do you have some milk for me? And they like, if you, you're not supposed to go up to the wildlife, but if you just sit down and mind your own business, they will come up to you and like lay on your lap. <laughs> and it's the most adorable thing ever. It's just like, uh, I could never, I could never, um, that's probably the most insane wildlife experience I've ever had. What's the what's the coldest weather you've had you felt on your trips? Because I understand it's cold all the time, but like, what's a really cold day? Yeah, Antarctica's actually never been that cold. I mean, it's like, it, and I'm there early in the season. And it's like it's like a solid 30, 32 oh. every day, and it doesn't really change that much. I mean, it's you know, if the wind can pick up and there's like catabatic winds, so it can be like. 70 miles an hour and then it feels fucking freezing. I would say the coldest I've experienced is up in up in Svalbard in the Norwegian Arctic on a snowmobile. <laughs> so you, you have to like really suit up and put like animal fat all over your face and like huge Whoa. yeah like your you have to wear shoes that are like five times too big and so you can like have space for the can, heat. Can you just uh break down the animal fat in your face? What what what's that? You just kind of slid that in as if it was a normal a normal everyday phrase. <laughs> you, you I guess it's to protect your skin from from like chafing from the freezing cold winds because you have to wear like a couple balaclavas like not just one but two or three. But underneath that, if you put like a, you know, a thick Vaseline or they give you this like animal fat, um, it keeps your face warm and, and so, and it won't like chafe as much because you're basically, you're, you're on a snowmobile. So you're going really fast in sub zero degrees already. Like if you're just standing and you're not on the snowmobile, it's like, 
it was probably like 15 below minus 15 i would say on average i want to talk about the big problem that is climate change just for a second like we discussed earlier you know it's such a kind of intimidating subject you know people just kind of put their backs up once it comes in do you feel positive in any way about what we're doing and kind of like what do you think we are getting right i think people are so aware of the negative things that's that are that's going on around our treatment of the planet i mean you know the fact that we're in quarantine is you know clearly one of them what do you think we are getting right at the moment yeah it's really easy to feel negative about what's happening there's a lot of horrible news out there but i do positive with my work and with my talks and there are a lot of things to celebrate overall i would say the thing that just keeps me going and keeps me positive is that we are moving in the right direction just not fast enough um but if you look at where we are now between now and like 10 years ago we're in a better place green energy has become way more affordable and accessible in the last decade um, there's a company in, I think, Switzerland called Climeworks that's created the world's first commercial carbon capturing technology that's literally taking carbon from the air and putting it back into the ground. There's, of course, the Green New Deal that's become a global movement in, in the past you know, year, I guess. Over 1,000 institutions, including New York City, have divested in fossil fuels, totaling over, I think it's over $9 trillion now. I'd have to double check that on the website. but. One big thing too is that there's there's new economic research that's showing that fast action on climate change will not only save us a lot of money, but it'll actually create a lot of wealth. There was a recent study that showed that fast decarbonization could add 26 trillion to the global economy by 2030, which I think is like one of the most important things because we run on money, right? Like that's what our country. That, it's that, it's that, how do you get people interested in the conversation? Well, look, we'll make you money. It's the same, it just, you know, I'm only interested in saving the planet if I'm going to make something out of it. You know, what's in it for me? Right, exactly. And it's, it's a harsh reality, but it is but the it's truth. A reality. So now that that, like those statistics are out there, I think we'll start to see things moving faster. I mean, especially now, I really hope that this, whole crisis we're in the middle of right now is going to really make people rethink how we move forward into the future. I don't, um, you know, I'm not holding my breath, but I, I do have hope. Um, and at least if, if not anything, this time has been really kind to the, to the climate because <laughs> we're not driving cars as much and we're not, you know, we're not doing everything that we normally do. So um, the carbon we're emitting is, has dropped significantly. Do you feel positive about the way that we're going? Um, yes, about the direction we're going, but I think it, we need to speed up a sure. lot. Um, There's a lot of good stuff that's happening. It's just not like being implemented fast enough. Is that because obviously, um, the backwards motions that the, a particular administration in America has, I mean, is it, is it things like that where it become, it's like almost along party lines in whatever country has elected officials. Is it like that kind of like we're not moving fast enough? Um, yeah, that's a huge part of it. Um, I think policy is like the biggest thing probably that's falling behind. Like we need, we, we definitely, I know that we need certain policies in place and that's the only thing that's really gonna actually do anything um, in the long run because we need like big corporations to really be making a difference, not like, in, you know, I don't think we should, as individuals feel like it's our responsibility to, to make the change. Like, yeah, it's important to recycle and to um, turn your heat down and to like drive your car less and try to ride your bike more and like compost your food and stuff like that. But ultimately we need much like bigger decisions to be made from, from above. You mentioned you were preparing for a show. What's happening? Uh, when will you next be digitally available or physically available? I'm not too sure that's the right way of saying that. When, <laughs> when, will you, when can we see your work next? <laughs> Fuck that. Well, <laughs> that was, that was, why, why, why couldn't you just, it was a very simple question, Doug. Um, I, we heard that you were making a new body of work. Where is that headed? And, um, are you still on schedule to have that show? Sort of. The answer is sort of. Um, I am. I am falling quickly behind on finishing the work in time because I don't have the big, the big um, 
pieces up here that are halfway worked on in Brooklyn and I couldn't find anyone to get them up here for me. So my show is as of now scheduled to open July 9th in Seattle. We are just going to take things as they come and I imagine we will have to move the opening date at least a few weeks forward. But the gallery does have a lot of time, you know, a chunk of time saved out for me. So it should be, it should still be up for a while, even if we open a few weeks late. For me, I did an interview yesterday, at the artist from Wuhan in China, who runs a graffiti festival out there. And obviously because of how everything has gone, he has now launched an online project where he's got all these photos of Wuhan uh, in lockdown and then he's sent them out to artists. He's assigned these photographs to artists that have been and got a connection, international artists that have a connection to Wuhan that have been there that know it. And he wants them to depict some sense of the Sakura, which is the spring. It's like the the, the flowers uh, that come through in spring. So it's the depiction of that on these photographs that will be a kind of like a digital uh, project. And I thought that was really cool. His whole ethos around it is, look, for the last three months, all I've heard is negativity around the, the word Wuhan and people have been sharing these images and depicting this image of, you know, people like, you know, eating bats and, and, and slaughtering all kinds of animals. And it's like, like so much of this just is a, a distorted reflection of what the reality is. So we had a really, really interesting conversation about his, his ethos around this project. I would love to have played a little clip here, uh, in the thing, but it was all done through a translator. The guy doesn't speak a word of English. So it would be a very pointless clip to play for the majority of our Western based audience. Is, is that one of the things that you're really fascinated about moving forward? Um, at least for the next, I mean, moving forward for the rest of our lives, Yes, but also just for the next six, seven months. I, I'm really fascinated about this is like how artists that I know are not used to the digital landscape in terms of presentation, how they start using more um, digital um, and just using this. And I don't mean Instagram. I mean creating websites or creating experiences with their art that is um, completely new to them and they're experimenting as we, you know, experiment too as viewers. Um, I think that's kind of what I'm really fascinated about. I I don't have any examples off the top of my head, to be honest, about like what people are doing. So I think people are adjusting on the fly. I thought Felipe Felipe Pantone's VR painting is is a natural like, yeah, that this was meant to be, hey, you can't go outside, but here's me getting up and kind of doing what I love to do. But the thing with Felipe is that he was already thinking about how we were going to view art in 2040. He 100% already occupied that space. He was like a fish in water for this. So it's more interesting to see how the ones that don't. How does like Jean Julian do it? Like, I, you know, I think somebody else or Jenny Morgan, the people that we've had on the podcast before who don't, ha we didn't even talk about those things with. Um, Zaria is an interesting one because she's sort of, she, she can, um, navigate the experience of being on these boats and create, I think like really, really nice. And she had, there's plenty of them on YouTube, like really nice comprehensive experiences of where her work comes from. Um, so she has kind of a natural sort of progression into maybe presenting even her next body of work as a digital experience. Um, it might take a little extra time, but she does it. I mean, she has this content. Um, but yeah, where, what we had, these are, the, I mean, are there going to be art fairs? You know, like what? I don't think so. Not for a while. I think for now, what that should remain is an open ended question. And we will wait and see how that starts to shape for for now. It's still early. It's still interesting to see. But it's it's more. This is where our psyche and the kind of the the, the, the collective thought process is starting to explore and starting to think down that way. It's going to be long term, this whole thing.
at this continued exploration of how people are doing it. You know, there's going to be the immediate and then there's going to be the, the, the much more long term. You know, I don't want to say because I, I hate hyperbole or I, I, or I try not to fall into that trap. But I mean, this is literally going to alter every single thing that we do. So it's kind of like it's, you know, I don't. As long as we can still do the podcast, baby, that's all that matters. But, hey, we're fine, baby. We're good. Once again, I'd just like to say thank you to Zaria for taking some time out of her day to sit down and talk with us. If you enjoyed that episode, please do let us know. Give the channel a like, subscribe from whatever platform you're using to catch these episodes. Till next time, stay safe, look after each other.